So um, my group has spent uh, quite a number of years um, in identifying and characterizing uh, um, APG and chromatin modifier enzyme, including um, um, two HDAC complex and a few methyl transfers and a mass transfer and the Jumanji family demethylase, as well as the uh, ubiquitin E3 ligase and you know TAT proteins. So for the theme of t today, I'm going to be mainly focused on the uh, TAT proteins. And then I will uh, basically quickly summarize what we have done on this, then move on to something new that is still uh, in developing, and which excites me these days. So, so basically, my interest in DNA methylation, as you can be traced back uh, during my postdoc more than uh, 25 years ago, where I purified the nerd complex, where you can see there's a few methyl DNA bonding proteins. So that's brought my interest into um, DNA, methyl DNA methylation. And then a subsequent, well, this goes, oh, why is, um, I think it's better, I just, just control here. Um, okay, so after we showed that uh, um, histone methylation can be reversed by the Jumanji family of proteins, then we start to attack the next question, that is whether a DNA methylation are reversible or not. So um, remove of the methyl group, uh, you know, demethylation of DNA, need to remove the methyl group attached to the five position of this pyrimidine ring. And you know, there's a previous uh, reaction that quite similar to this, that is the semi uh, to in semi salvage pathway in fungi and parasites, as you can see, from semi to uracil, it's re required to remove this methyl group in the five position of this pyramidal ring. And this salvage pathway involves two enzymes. First, the semi hydroxylase use alpha keto gluten ion as a cofactor, which is the same thing as the Jumanji family protein. Through oxidation, convert the five, this methyl group to hydroxymethyl, formal, and carboxyl, then the isolated decarboxyl remove this. So that's how the chemistry of this uh, semi to uracil um, reaction take place. So if demethylation happens, from chemistry point of view, it should be you know, very likely to use this mechanism. So therefore, many years ago, um, Klaus, Rob Close um, come to the lab, I asked him to use two kind of approach to look for the uh, DNA demethylase. The first one, just simple, search for semi-hydroxylase, the uh, uh, homolog, the other one used biochemical assay, Similar to what we use for the identification of Jumanji family proteins, the difference is use DNA rather than histone as a substrate. Um, unfortunately, he ended up do not get either org because you know when he he used um, the fungi or parasite semi-hydroxylase blast, there's a new membrane hormone come back. On the other hand, now we know HeLa cells is what we use for the um, protein extract. HeLa cell exerts very little or almost no expression of TAT proteins. And so he moved on and quickly worked on some Jumanji protein, probably a few people went to Oxford to get faculty position, but the question he's supposed to address was not uh, um, addressed. Then this paper come out and showed that the base GI bonding protein have features of semi-hydroxylase. So that's how Get me interested in base gel bonding protein. Use base gel bonding protein blast. So this time, there are many of the, you know basically all these uh, fungi are parasite proteins. But far away here, there's a, a few unknown proteins that have hom a little bit of homology. So importantly, this homology are all in the dioxin domain, and that's exactly the kind of chemistry we kind of hypothesize need to use dioxin and alpha keto gluten ion as a cofactor. So therefore, we did not ignore this. Then at this point, Anna come to the lab, she cloned all this retired protein and transfect into 293 T cells. As you can see, these are the transfected cells. Then they kind of reduced 5 methyl C, suggests this has the potential. So she spent a lot of time trying to make this TAT protein, which is quite big, 
and she couldn't express. At this point, another person come to rescue. She, he had worked with the backlog virus before he can express big protein. Then set up a, a, a similar chromatography assay where we basically can check the nucleoside, nucleotide. So what he should, this TLC uh, result indicate that after incubated with pet protein, you have another spot appear, and this spot does not co migrate with C or, hydro or methyl C. So we assume it's going to be carboxy, the, the you know, end product, the oxidation of, of thymine hydroxylase. Um, at this point, Angela Rohr published his her landmark paper shows that TAT1 can convert 5 methyl C to general 5 hydroxymethyl C. So using antibody against 5 hydroxymethyl C, actually, we showed that the transfected cells that overexpress this TAT proteins um, general 5 hydroxymethyl C. So we went on and also showed that one play important role in, in embryonic development. So, so this is good. However, based on our initial hypothesis, you know, this should not stop here, should it general pharmacy and carboxy. So why we initially did not detect this? Then we went back to the assay that we use the TLC. So this is the assay where we detect the enzymatic activity. Basically, we use a G CCGG, that's a restriction in them for MSP1. We kind of assume that MSP1 will digest regular CCGG regardless, this inner cell is modified a lot. So if the modification you know, uh, does not uh, kind of prevent MSP1 digestion, then this inner cell cannot be expressed, uh, exposed, cannot be end labeled, then we will miss that. So to check whether that's the case, we uh, contact the Ho Chuan and he, he you know, start, we start to collaborate, and he, he synthesized a different form of modified C, then we use this to test MSP1 cut or not. So the result is shown here. Basically, it will cut, you know, C, hydroxymethyl C, uh, and 5 methyl C, but do not digest if the inner cell is formal C carboxy, okay? So then we're looking for restriction in them that doesn't care about the inner cell modification. We found that the another tag one, T, which were regular TCGA, that does not care about the modification status. It can cut. Then we can check whether the TAD protein can generate pharmacy or carboxy. So to cut a long story short, it was 2D signal chromatography. We do identify that two actual spots, XY, XLY, and then we show the XY calling the pharmacy carboxy. So basically, TAD protein in vitro can generate all the oxidation state. And importantly, we further demonstrate that in ES cell, that these formal C carboxy are, you know, uh, uh, components of the DNA. And importantly, if we, we look uh, down, TAD proteins, those will accumulate. So it indicated that in ES cell, you know, this TAD protein responsible for generating all the oxidative state. So, you know, um, Gunnar's group uh, around the same time also published that TAD protein can generate carboxy as well as the uh, uh, TDG can get rid of the carboxy. So based on Angela Ross' work, uh, our, our work and uh, uh, Gunnar's work, uh, then we can generate the cyclic methylation demethylation circle. Basically, uh, DMT will put the methyl group, TAD protein or oxide that generate different form of oxidative state, then TDG will um, cleave this uh, formal cell carboxy through basic excision repair and return to cytosine. So we further actually in years uh, demonstrate this thing does happen because if you block, get rid of the enzyme at different stage, then different thing will accumulate. And this thing will mainly happen in the transcription regulatory element. So the accumulation mainly there. That means active methylation, demethylation take place mainly in transcription regulatory elements. So then we went on to study the biologic function during uh, embryonic development. There are two stages that global demethylation take place. One is in zygote. Um, the other one is during PGC. Um, in PGC, during their migration through the genital ridge. So to cut the long story short, we, we 
found, you know, we as well as the Gornell School found that HAT3 actually oxidizes the five methyl say not, not get rid of the carbon and to generate hydroxyl and form say carboxyl, then through replication dependent dilution and reach lowest level in the blast system where only the implant gene are still maintained methylation. So after implantation, reset the whole in, in AP genetic uh, um, modifications. Then in PGC, we published two stories. The first one is that had protein controls the activation. So, uh, so demethylation is important for meiosis because the meiotic gene activation depends on TAT1 and importantly, TAT1 also involves the erasure of the genomic imprinting uh, during that process. So to summarize our TAT work, so basically we show us TAT proteins can oxidize 5 methyl state to generate all these three kind of oxidative state. Then DNA demethylation can be achieved through TAT mediated 5 methyl state Oxidation followed by TDG uh, mediated cleavage and basic excision repair. And in paternal DNA methylation, it takes uh, by two steps. First, oxidation, and second, replication di dilution. Then, in, in, um, um, in TAT1, also important for meiotic gene expression and also in the erasure of imprint um, um, methylation. So now I want to switch gear, uh, tell you something that we are currently working on. Uh, so that's about the aging. Okay. So a little bit jump. About 18 years ago, uh, Weissman and Randall's group performed this interesting experiment where they link the young, you know, the blood system, second system with of old mice with young, and that re re resulted to rejuve rejuvenation of old mice. And during the past 18 years, many, many groups tried to look for and find the magic factors in young mice or young blood that can make, you know, rejuvenate or make people young. But so far, there's no consensus, okay, put it this way. And a few years ago, um, people did a simple experiment where they simply transplant the hemopoly stem cell of young into old that can rejuvenate and expand lifespan. Because yes, uh, not sorry, hemopoly stem cell is simpler than the blood because the blood has many different cells and many, many other things. You don't know what, what is there. Then we decided to work on hemopoly stem cell. So the question is, you know, what are the functional defect of old HSC, right? Because if we can find out what's the defect, we can try to fix or avoid, okay? So using single cell analysis, we found that in young mice, so the HSC are homogeneous. They are transcriptor are younger, they have a younger APH, they function better, okay, in terms of generate uh, progeny cells and um, maintain the balance and differentiation. On the other hand, the, in old mice, their HSC are heterogeneous. Their transcription, you, know, you can separate it into many different types, uh, including you know, young one and old one. Although they are the same mass, their APH of the HSC is heterogeneous as well. And their function have good and bad, depending on whether they have what kind of transcription. And importantly, we can, if we remove bad HSC, the, the APH old HSC, we can rejuvenate. So this is basically the summary, and in the next few slides, I will present you um, evidence. So this is a single cell uh, transcriptome of young and old HSC from, okay? So you can see very little overlap. In the majority does not overlap. The overlap one are in active cycle. So these are in cell cycle, where non-overlap one are, are quiescent state. And importantly, with further analysis, the quiescent, you know, young, the quiescent young HSC are homogeneous, but the quiescent old HSC are heterogeneous. And importantly, so we separate into three classes, like Q1, Q2, Q3. Q1, Q2 express signature genes that only express or highly express in old mice, while the Q3, although Q1, Q2, Q3 from the same mice, they express the signature genes that equivalent to young mice. So indicating Q1, Q2 um, is different from Q3. So then 
we need to identify markers if we want to ask whether there's a functional difference. So we identify a marker. That's a CD150 cell surface marker that mainly expresses Q1, Q2, and very only expresses in Q3. So using this property, we can know, we can show that in young mice, the HSC mainly, the majority is expressed very low of this marker. While in old mice, this is expressed high. And importantly, when we do APH analysis, this young, the CD1, no one is younger than CD1 high, HSC, although they are come from same mice. So they are chronic uh, um, age uh, are the same. And importantly, after we transplant into mice to competition, we can see that the CD1 for no one competed much better. They can contribute to T cell, B cell, amyloid cell much better than CD1 for high one from the same old mice. So the question is why CD1 for the high HSCs are less competent in general preferred blood? So to answer this question, we perform a differentiation analysis where we transplant this low and high one into recipient, then we enter the bone marrow. As you can see, basically, the CD1 the high one, they kind of stuck in long term HSC. You know, the majority stuck here, they do not go through the differentiation. Where, where the CD1 low one, they can successfully go through differentiation general progenitor cells. So that's the Reason. But the important thing is, does the differ differentiation defect the city of high HSC contribute to aging related to defect? So that's important. So to, to address this question, we from the same old mice, 24 months old mice, and divided the, their HSC into three groups. CD1 for no, high, and the unsorted one, just the mixed one, and transplanted into recipient mice, wait for you know, at least half a year to check their bone, you know, preferred blood and some physical tests. So what I show you here is a hemopoietic, you know, analysis about B cells. As you increase of the CD1 have the high population, they decrease the B cells, but the myeloid cell increase. This is similar to older people, okay? And importantly, we found that red blood cell count as well as hemoglobin decrease as the CD1 for the high level increase. So whether the hemopoietic defect, you know, leading to age-related physical defect. So to answer this question, we perform some behavior test. So what I show you here is test the balance capability of these mice. Uh, basically, if they balance well, they are healthier, they can walk through the beam much faster and, uh, you know, take a shorter time to reach the end. So it, basically, this is one of the tests. We did many, many different tests to save time. I don't show you slides uh, for those. So I will just show you a summary slides of all these tests, physical tests we did. We did grip strength, wear, herring, rod, rod, treat meal, poor test in every single test. The, as you increase the CD150 population, it becomes worse. So importantly, the, these mice have different APH. So basically, the one that receives CD1 for the high, no one is much younger than the one receive CD1 for the high transplantation. So, you know, now the question is, does the um, decrease in the CD1 high HSA ratio result to re regulation? So basically, we here, they have a different ratio. So to do this, we perform another experiment where we basically from the same old mice, we separate pure river CD1 for now and high population, we mix them in different ratio. So one is one to three ratio, there is a one to two ratio. If these two relative compare, it's, it's like, oh, we remove some bad population of CD1 for the high population. Then we found that this actually, um, so one to one ratio is better in terms of contribute to T cell, B cell, um, um, myeloid cells. And importantly, in differentiation assay, one to one ratio, again, is better than one to three ratios. If you look, you know, how much of them stuck, and how much of them go to generally um, um, the, the um, common myeloid, no, um, the, the common um, progenitor cells. 
So remove CD1 high actually they can improve hemoprocess, all right? So the question is, can we achieve targeted CD1 high removal? You know, because if we think of practically, we cannot, you know, transplant to human. So, so the good approach is to target removal in vivo. So the way we use is to link this antibody to a toxin um, separate, and this one prevented translation. Okay. So we can achieve dose-dependent removal kidney of the um, hemopolyse stem cell. This is in vitro. And the question is, are they CD1 high? I just say preferentially killed. Can we achieve some kind of specificity because you do not want to kill CD1, so no HSC. So this one, we perform another experiment. We use age-matched old uh, mice, you know, mark, marked by CD45.1 or 0.2. We mix them. Then we test different concentration of the toxin. Uh, it's no concentration. It does not touch, you know, does not kill the CD1 or no one, but still cut, um, still kill the CD1 for high population. As we increase the dosage, then this start also kill, you know, the CD1 no population, but it's kill more than the CD1 high. So there's a specificity. How about in vivo? So for the in vivo assay, we basically inject through tailwind, inject this complex into mice, old mice. Then we see a dose-dependent cleaning of HSC, and importantly, the distribution, distribution shift, okay? As you can see, here, the, so compared with the PBIs, is a different dosage, and here's the quantification, CD1, no one keep increase, this is a no one increase, and CD1, high one decrease. So now we are waiting for the mice. So probably at least a half a year, we will do test whether this mouse get rejuvenated or not. To summarize, use single cell RNA seq. We revert the histogenicity in old HSC and CD1 for the high HSC are functional defect in long term to short term differentiation. Uh, accumulation of CD1 high HSC in old mice contributes to hemopoiety and physical decline. Decrease in CD1 high HSC ratio improve hemopoiesis and CD1 high HSC can be preferably removed by this. Uh, complex. So the take home message, very simple. Rather than looking for magic factor in young, maybe get rid of bad in old, might be an alternative for rejuvenation. And here are the people who contribute to work. Thank you for your attention.